All right, so chapter eight is about, well, it's about dealing with employees. And there's probably very few places in business where ethical conundrums are going to come up as readily as when you're dealing with employees. And so just to start off the conversation, I just made a statement. Why do you think that's true or not true? Why do ethical issues come up a lot when you're dealing with, your, with hiring, promoting, and firing people? Because you're going to be looking for a certain, like you as an employer, are looking for certain people, specific people who won't meet your standards. But I thought you said I read through a little bit of the chapter. I said that like <clears throat> um, you can't always like come out and say like exactly what you're looking for if you're looking for somebody who's like over six foot tall or whatever else. Right. Um, because people say, "Well, I can't, I can't work for you then," or what? Right. So. So it, hiring people and promoting people and firing people necessarily involves a word that we think is a bad word in our society, and that word is discrimination. Now, I think we need to recognize that there's different forms of discrimination. Discriminating upon, uh, on something that somebody has zero control over and it has zero to do with the job uh, is almost universally recognized as ethically wrong, right? But discriminating on bases that may have something to do with the job, we were just talking about my daughter playing volleyball. She's a middle blocker. Why? Well, because she's six feet tall. Could a person who's five foot four be a middle blocker? Maybe if they had serious hops, right? But height matters in that job, okay? Um, to be a college professor, having a knowledge and an education in the background of the topic you're teaching matters for that job. But other times people get confused and they think, and they think things matter that don't, right? And so that's one of the huge ethical issues we run into. We have to discriminate between candidates or between for, for promotion or whatever, but we want to make sure we're discriminating in a, a fair and meaningful way, not on the basis of something that's protected by law or just wrong to discriminate on. Um, so that's the big issue. You know, they have all these little things they list out in the chapter, but if you think about it, they all come back to that, which is, how do I choose, if we don't like the word discriminate, how do I choose between two candidates? How do I reach the candidates that I think would be best there? And I'll tell you, I hate, human resources is my least favorite part about owning a business. I hate firing people. Why? Because it's their livelihood to say, hey, I can't use you anymore, even if it's not their fault, especially if it's not their fault. You don't feel as bad about getting rid of somebody who's been you know, involved in misconduct or something, but when it's somebody who it's just like, hey, I don't have, I don't have the work for you right now, man, and then I know you've got a wife and kids, or, uh, or I know that you have a house payment or or whatever, that's really hard. And then I hate hiring, because in hiring everybody's trying to give you this perfect image of themselves, and you're like, this person's lying to me right now. They're not really lying. They're trying to present the best image, but you, it feels, you know. Like feel like it should be dating or something. Like, can we just do a trial? You know, can we, like, let's just go out to dinner, see how it goes. Like, you know, no promises. But you can't do that in hiring uh, a lot of times. All right. So, so this kind of just goes through in order. It starts with hiring. And the, the first issue is, how do we announce the job opening? Who can tell me what the word nepotism means? Yeah. Are providing yeah favorable hiring treatment to family members right? Um, Is that legal? No. no, it's not illegal. Chandler, your family owns a business. Who works for your business? Family. Exactly right. Your mom, yeah. your siblings. Does anybody think it's morally wrong that in their small business they choose to hire their family members first? Probably not. Do you think their family members are more knowledgeable about the things they're selling than a, a new person? Probably. Yeah, but it's hard to hire them whenever they're being it's true. It, it, it's it's way true. That's one of the challenges to nepotism. And, and what, uh, like a pro is that they're actually uh, a little more committed to because it's not just some random business. They're like right. Family. Right. My mom wanted me to take over her business when she retired, and I didn't want it, so I ended up selling it to someone else. But you know. If I had taken that business over, could you imagine the pressure? She'd made it run successfully for 20 years. I don't want to kill it, right? Um, it's, it's hard when your mom's smarter than you at, at stuff. Uh, you know, and I've been to business school and everything else. 
and I don't know that she's smarter than me, but she, she never went to business school. She learned everything through trial and error for those 20 years. And so now I have all these great ideas because I got my master's degree in business and I don't want to mess up the thing that she's worked so hard to build. Um, what about nepotism in a public sector job? For example, here at EAC, I'm in my position as a division chair for the business division, I have about 20 people that report to me. So I get to hire if somebody if if you know somebody quits or retires or whatever, I get to hire a new person. Would it be wrong for me to steer an EAC job to my wife or to my kids within my division? Yeah. I don't know if it's the same, but my dad he was kind of saying he had to hire a uh, a new teacher and my brother's wife wanted to apply and so they made it work and I'm part of that. Okay. So I, I think that's like What did your dad do? What was his role? He gave recommendations. No, but what was his role at the organization? So he would be the direct supervisor of this person. So some organizations have specific rules that just say no. We had a problem here where the, the, the director of marketing and public relations here at the college worked here, right? And then his wife was a faculty member in the nursing faculty. Not a problem. They were working in different areas, not responsible. Then they did an open search. The director of marketing and public relations applied, and he became the president of the college. So now he's the president. And his wife is still an instructor here. And we have some rules against nepotism in direct lines of authority. In other words, a husband and a wife or, or siblings could work at different parts of the college, but you can't be a supervisor for somebody. Um, luckily, in that case, it works out because the nursing division chair is, that, is, is her boss, and then the dean over nursing and allied health is her boss, then the vice president of, of academics is that dean's boss and then it gets like there's a pretty big layer of bureaucracy before it gets to, to, to there but could it be an issue if suddenly she wanted something and she got preferential treatment because she's the president's wife sure so mostly you just have to kind of guard against it as best you can in a small business nepotism is pretty normal and not always a bad thing there's pros and cons to it um, another way of announcing a job is through an internal public announcement here at EAC, a lot of times if we're hiring a part-time person, we just send out an email to all the other employees saying, I'm looking for someone in my area. Feel free to share this with your family members or people out that you know, but we don't like go through this big public announcement. We just kind of hit it with an email. And that's pretty sufficient. The reason we like doing that is because EAC has certain values and there's a certain uh I don't know, a certain culture here. And so a lot of times when you reach out to family members of people that already live here or people they know, it's people who share that those same feelings. Um, our community has, I mentioned the other day, it's probably more conservative than the world as a whole. Um, and so when we hire someone locally or from within, it, it, it sort of keeps that. Um, I have a friend who's a faculty member here at the college who is, who is a liberal atheist. And it's a little hard for him here, not because anybody's mean or Tim at all, but because, like, for dating, he says, how can I, how can I ask a Mormon girl to go on a date with me, knowing that we, our belief systems are so far off the mark that it's going to be an issue for us? I'm like, I don't know, man. You know, uh, interesting side story. He did start dating an LDS girl, and I became, like, his advisor to all things Mormon, right? Like, why does she do this? When she says she has to be at, at, at youth group on a Wednesday night, like is she just is she just trying to dog out on me or no? She she legit has a responsibility, you know. Every, anyway, so that was a, that was for him, okay. And so the third is what's called a mass public announcement. So like when they hired the new president of the college and when they hired the new vice president position here, they they put it out everywhere. They put it in in uh, education periodicals that other educators read. Uh, they put it in in uh, you know some national publications and then they took applicants from all over um, they ended up hiring someone local anyway probably because the hiring committees you know said we feel like this person is a good fit for what we're trying to do the hiring committee in that case was two faculty members and the college board of directors um, anyway so those are your kind of three options and each of them has pros and cons 
and different ethical challenges that might come up. Um, so I, anybody ever get hired for a job that was way different than what it sounded like when you were applying? Yeah, that's happened to you. Can, do you mind sharing about it or? Uh -huh. Okay. So I did that too. It was a little weird. Like a thing about the job and like Was it a sales job? Yeah, it was a sales job, but it wasn't like door to door. It was like family and friends. So like multi like multi level marketing more. Why do you think so many multi-level marketing organizations are secretive about the process in, when they're doing hiring? Because nobody wants to do that. Because it sucks, right, to have to like pressure your family and friends into, into buying something. Nobody wants to do that. Um, is it wrong? Is it, is it morally or ethically wrong, the way they do business? Okay, so is it wrong? <laughs> I like how nobody ever wants to be like, this is wrong. It's, we live in a world right now where like to say somebody's wrong is, is judging people and judging is terrible. It's like, like, so we'll call it deceptive, but we won't say that's wrong. Even though I think most people would say, is it wrong to deceive people? Most people would be like, yeah. But if we get on a specific topic, it's like, well, I don't want to say that they're being because... But I'm not making fun of you. This is this is the world we live in. I mean, just listen to, watch. Anybody been watching any of the Kavanaugh uh, uh, hearings, right? Like the people asking the questions have so much subtext under what they're asking. The guy answering the question has so much subtext under you know he has to answer in this like perfectly politically approved way. Um, even though nothing he says there, unless he drops a bombshell, is going to change the vote either way. So either he has the support in the Senate or he doesn't. I think maybe one thing that may have pushed things in his favor is Senator Booker tried to do some grandstanding the other day and say, well, I don't care what the rules are. I'm releasing this classified information because it tells what a rotten person Brett Kavanaugh is. And then it turns out the information had already been released, so he was trying to make himself sound like he was being a rebel. you know. And I think that got more attention than a lot of the questions. I think that might shame a couple of other Democrats into saying, because their constituents are going to say, hey, quit the grandstanding and just you know, vote for this guy or don't vote for this guy. And it might shame a few people who weren't going to vote for him into having to vote for him because of their constituents' concerns now. Because that made it look like the Democrats didn't have anything real, so they were trying to blow up a little thing into a big thing, even though it may be real. If you read this, the information... It was an opinion he wrote when he was when he was uh, involved in the executive branch of the government as an attorney, and an opinion he wrote about um, about I think it had to do with um, ISIS and the way we treat some uh, uh, profiling, so profiling Muslim people. Um, as potential terrorists and things like that. And so some people could look at that and say, this guy's got some racist tendencies. You know, he's willing to profile. Other people, if you remember that time when that was happening, we were probably all profiling and all like nervous that, you know, when's the next thing going to, you know, was after 9-11. Anyway, but so it was probably meaningful information, but the way they blew it up didn't necessarily help their cause. And, and, and so that's what's interesting about watching this. Anyway, so back to accuracy and deception and whether that's right or that's wrong. I would suggest it is morally wrong to hire somebody for one thing and then say, oh, now that you have the job, you have to do this. Okay. Um, and we might say it depends on what it is, right? There's, of course, more and more extreme swings, you know, to hire somebody as a uh, you know, something really innocuous like a salesperson that you find out it's actually a prostitution ring or something like that would be an extreme version of it. Um, but certainly, I think when you're hired to to 
sell cutlery and you find out that it's a multi-level thing where I'm having to, I feel almost uncomfortable with the way you want me to sell this, you feel that way almost. Like they turned you into a, almost like a prostitute. Right? I mean, that's why people don't like it. It feels dirty. And, 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 and if you want me to do something like that, you should tell me up front and let me choose whether or not I'm going to do that. Okay. Just so you know, I'm not opposed to multi-level sales, um, you know, Tupperware and, and, and uh, what's the oils? doTERRA. doTERRA. You know, they deliver real products to real people that bring real value. And they found that that marketing strategy works for them. It gets into people's homes. Um, and so it's not like it's a scam. It's just that some people are comfortable with that and some aren't. And you should know up front what you're getting into. And then this is the biggie. This is what we always get accused of here at the college. Announcing the post to people who have no chance of getting hired. In other words, you already chose. You already knew who you were going to hire, but to make it look up and up, you had to go through this whole song and dance, right, of interviewing us and making me do a resume, and then you weren't going to hire me anyway. I will tell you, I've sat on many hiring committees here at the college, and that is rarely the case, that they know who they're hiring beforehand, that legitimately they're looking at candidates. They may have an idea, but they are willing to hire someone else if they're a better fit. Um, you know, but we get accused of that all the time here. You know, you've got to be in with the right people to get hired at the college. Well, that's probably true to an extent, but that's true of almost any job. Knowing people on the inside is helpful to getting hired. Um, Yeah. Doesn't that reduce risk for the employer if they have some idea of, of how hard you work or don't before? Yeah. Did they ever get accused of nepotism at the tribe? Uh huh. Uh huh. And hate being in detention. That's oh, terrible. Right. And let's say so. So, what is the downside to that sort of giving preferential treatment to certain individuals or groups? Because there's an upside. You, you know the people. You you know what to expect. What's the downside? Just like she said, it's probably not the best fit. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes you may not get the, the best employee for the job because you were limiting the employee pool to a smaller group of people. So that's the trade-off. And it, so that, that's what, you know, that creates this sort of ethical conundrum is I've got to do right by the business and I've got to do right by the community and I've got to do right by my family and I've got to try to balance all those ethical needs when I'm hiring. Um, and that can be challenging, I mean, obviously. So as we screen people, the big question is, if we, if we put out a job opening here at the college and we get 26 applicants, guess what, when I'm on the committee, guess what my first thought is? Who can I X out of this list right off the bat? Don't have to waste their time or my time anymore. How can I just get them off the list? That's the first big question. Are there people who just so... Let me give you a secret. If you ever apply for a secretarial position and you have a typo or a spelling error in your application materials, for me, you're done. Okay? I suck at that stuff. But So if I catch yours, you know, if I'm hiring you as a secretary, it's because I need you to be better at that than I am. <laughs> right? So, so you look for, like, legitimate. That's legitimate, though, right? The nature of a secretary's job is that they have to be good at not at putting out a, a nice finished product uh, when it comes to written work and things like that. But for other jobs, honestly, you can't really just immediately eliminate anybody without some very specific rules. That's why you'll see position open notices that spell out exactly what's expected for the job. And then if someone doesn't demonstrate that, 
you can use that too. Just so you know that, right? When you're hiring, when we're hiring, it's the process of elimination. How do I make this big pool narrow down to a smaller, more manageable pool? And then how do I choose the best qualified candidate out of that smaller pool? That's the process we're going through. So things like typos, the look of your materials, and then your how you answer the requirements of the of the position open notice really matter into getting you into the the little stack. I'm a pretty good interviewer. If I can get in front of people, I usually have a good chance of getting the job. So I've got to make sure my materials will get me in front of people. Anybody ever heard of a BFOQ before reading this chapter? In legal environment, we talked about them. What's a BFOQ? Can anybody tell me? Good job, a, a bona fide or bona fide, depending on how you like to say it, occupational qualification. So what this lets you do as an employer is you have you can define there are certain traits that are necessary for this job. Do you remember my story? They actually have it in the chapter. They talked about it a little bit about Hooters, right? The one in this, in our book, was about a dude trying to get hired as a Hooters waitress. And them saying, like, um, that doesn't really fit our business model, right? And so the question was, can they discriminate on that basis? Can they say that the nature of our business model is beautiful women in tight T-shirts working as waitresses and a guy or a not-so-beautiful woman? You're in dangerous territory, right? What does that mean? Is not qualified for the job. And the answer is, yeah. They can exclude on that basis if they can show this is our business model. It'd be harder with a woman to say she wasn't attractive enough or didn't look as good enough in a, in a Hooters shirt or something because that's subjective. Whereas gender, well, that's becoming more and more subjective as we saw from our previous discussion, but gender is less so. Okay, but it, that's really dangerous territory. You're like on edge of getting yourself sued when you start trying to make, whereas a more reasonable bona fide occupational qualification might be able to lift 40 pounds if the job legitimately requires someone to lift 40 pounds. Now, if it doesn't, you can't do that. Why? Well, because it discriminates against certain classes of people. There will be fewer women able to lift 40 pounds over their head than there are men. So you're you're setting up a qualification that impacts one group more than another without a bona fide reason for doing so. But if the job legitimately requires it, fine. Okay, maybe a fire department, you know, you have to have the ability to pass a certain physical fitness test because your job is to break into burning buildings and carry out incapacitated people. You have to be able to do that. Okay. The military, they get away with all sorts of these. I can't fly aircraft because of my vision. Really? You couldn't make a prescription visor or something? or But they get away with it. Um, you have to be willing to kill people and blow things up to be in the military. And if you're going to go into special operation forces, say like a Green Beret or a Ranger, you have to be willing to uh, do more things that are really distasteful. And you can be screened out just by saying, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. Okay, I worked in intelligence. Um, waterboarding is it's pretty much torture, guys. It's pretty horrible. Um, you know, I know there's all this debate as to whether or not, because it's not really killing them, uh, it's pretty terrible. So, and yet, if I thought somebody had information that would protect my wife and my kids, I'd waterboard them. I'd, I'd probably break their arms. I'd probably do what I had to do to get the information out of them. But I had, that was part of, you know, I won't say that's part of my job. I never had to break someone's arm, okay, in an interview session. Um, but I had to have times when I, I was more aggressive than, than the me you know. Uh, I had to have times when I was willing to lie on behalf of my country to hold to a cover story. I had to do those sorts of things. And if I wasn't willing to, I probably shouldn't have worked there, right? I had to make a determination if I thought that was a reasonable thing. So that's a bona fide occupational qualification. Some means of narrowing the pool that's legitimate. Other things include like education. 
Again, be careful when you say a bachelor's degree is required because the question that's going to come up in a legal scenario is, is a bachelor's degree really required to do this job? If there's state licensure, like teachers have to have a bachelor's degree, well then yeah, that saves you, right? Because you can say you've got to have a bachelor's degree to be a teacher because the state won't license them as a teacher unless we, we do it. Lifestyle choices. What about someone who smokes pot outside of work? Can you not hire them because of that? Can you have a drug test? Yeah. Is it okay? Why is it okay? They say, I don't come to work high. I've got a medical marijuana card. But I don't come to work high. I only use it outside of work. Same as people who drink alcohol at work. Do you see the challenge inherent in this, though? Why can I not do legal things? I mean, it used to be you couldn't get hired as a teacher if you were a married woman. Only single young women could be teachers. Once they got married, they had to quit. That was the mindset in the early 1900s. Okay? Why? People, someone asked why, right? And they came up with like a, you know, because a, a married woman's place is in her home with her family and her children. That was the answer. That was the mindset of the time. Are there things today that we, that we hold out there as prohibitions that 50 years from now will be seen like, imagine how backward they were. They wouldn't let people smoke weed at work. So backward, right? Maybe like your surgeon should be smoking weed because they'd be all mellow and just be like, Whoa, he's hemorrhaging. Clamp. Like that. It's cool. Like, like I'm going to clamp it off, eat some Doritos, and move on. Um, criminal history. Did you know the law actually prohibits you from discriminating against people based on their criminal history uh, in hiring? Unless their criminal history is related specifically to, like, say, if they, if they had embezzled funds, you wouldn't hire them for banking. Okay? Or... There is reason to believe their criminal history makes them a danger to people. So, so say somebody uh, somebody had been you know busted for possession of marijuana, uh, and then they were they were getting hired for a teaching job. You'd have to demonstrate. Here's our reason for saying that we think possession of marijuana makes them unfit for a teacher, especially if it was five years ago or something, right? Yeah, so so something I kind of skipped over um, is Arizona is what's called a right to work state. And pretty much in this state, um, you can just not hire somebody or you could fire somebody at will. Or sometimes it's called an at will employment state. I think that's what they call it in the book, which means I don't have to give a reason. I can just say, I chose this person. But if they do decide to sue you, they can subpoena all of the hiring records. So any discussion that was had that was, say, recorded in the hiring committee room or any notes people wrote on their resume as they were looking at it, they can subpoena all that. That's why we, are, we're, we get instruction here when we're on these hiring committees. You know, make sure you don't make any visible notes on any of these materials. Be respectful and, and understand what you're talking about. And so, you know, so if we were in a meeting and I said, well, I don't know if we should hire this guy. He's pretty old, <laughs> right? Like he's probably only got like five years left in him. Uh, if I said something like that and then he, he came back and said, I think I wasn't hired for this job because of age discrimination. And if somebody had recorded that or written those notes down, he'd have a case. Whereas if we never discussed that and we just said, he doesn't look like a good fit for the job but, and this person does, then he'd have zero case. We'd just say we, we chose the candidate we thought was best. And so you can see a lot of the ethical conundrum that comes up with hiring is that the law forces us to not speak openly about maybe our real reasons for not wanting to hire somebody. Because, it you know, age might be a legitimate reason to say, like, I need someone who's going to be here for 20 years, and yet it's not legally. 
you can't do that. You can't discriminate based on age. So instead, people like start doing code words, right? Like, not a good fit for the organization or <laughs> things like that. Anyway, just quickly, I, I, I always take too long talking, guys. Sorry. Um, things like testing, lie detector tests. When I worked for the NSA, I had to do lie detector tests, uh, which is incredibly uncomfortable. Uh, just be like, I kind of talked about some of the stuff with my wife that I wasn't supposed to, and are they going to find out and then think I'm a spy or something? Yeah. I thought I read in the thing that it said that they are. Like, unless it's like some kind of. Like, when you're the federal government, you get away with things that that a, a regular employer cannot compel a lie detector test except for under certain circumstances. And that's why you have an HR person. You go to HR and say, hey, can we do this or can we not? And they're supposed to know the law. Yeah. Sure, sure. And, and that, that's an area where, where clearly it would make sense to not have convicted felons as police officers. So, yeah. Um, and then the and then social media history. If you think employers are not scanning your social media, you're wrong. Okay, they're checking it out. So if you've got a picture of yourself demonstrating super bad judgment right there on your Facebook page or whatever other social media, Instagram, um, that's probably a bad idea. You should probably clean that up. Okay. Now, probably if you're hiring for a job at El Charo to be a server, they're probably not checking that out as much. Maybe they are. But I, I promise you, if you're hiring for a position where you're going to represent the organization in a public way, they're checking all of that. And, they, and honestly, you put it out there, right? Your social media is controlled by you, except your friends post crap. Like if you like hammered at a party or something, and you're like, dude, come on, don't put that out there. Uh, tag with you. Know, remember that time you were so yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Anyway, so and then then and then the interviewing process. So your questions need to be fair and they need to be pertinent. And by pertinent I mean they have to matter to the job you're hiring for. There are some pretty cool weird questions. Um, Google and some others are using these kind of weird questions now to to just see how you respond under pressure. Uh, the last job interview I had, which was actually just last semester, I interviewed for a job here at the college. Um, they they stuck to the more standard questions, you know, tell me about a time when you had to, you know, solve a problem under pressure. Uh, but some of their questions, you know, were more like weird problem solving type questions. And uh, I thought those might be interesting. Let me see if I've got it up right here. No, so we don't record them. And you know, that's what your lawyer will tell you, right? Your lawyer will tell you don't do any more than you have to because you don't want to create scenarios where – so what page did I say? 343 and 344. So here's some of their questions. I thought they were interesting enough to, to share a couple of them. How many golf balls can fit in a school bus? Someone might say that's not pertinent to anything. But I would submit to you that for certain jobs, the ability of someone to come up with a reasonable answer or a funny, you know, an answer that, like, recognized how kind of goofy of a question that was and then came up with some sort of reasoned and well thought out, well, you know, I know you could fit approximately this many here, so it's probably somewhere, even if they're not right, might tell you a lot about the person and how they deal with things like that. I have never been asked that. Um, this one says, you are shrunk to the height of a nickel, and your mass is proportionately reduced so as to maintain your original density. You are then thrown into an empty glass blender. The blades will start moving in 60 seconds. What do you do? Yeah, get really close to the blades and duck, right? I don't know. Like I saw this on Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Uh, yeah. I don't know. All right, see, you guys, this would throw you off. 
How much should you charge to wash all of the windows in the city of Seattle? Again, if they come up with some reasonable way of thinking about that, well, I think my, you know, I think the cost uh, of materials to wash one window is probably this much. I don't exactly know how many, but let's say there's approximately this many windows. Uh, and then I have to factor in some reasonable profit for myself. So, like, if somebody went through that, I'd be impressed with that, right? If they were like, I don't know, or what's Seattle, or whatever, then that would tell me something. Anyway, and there was more in there. I just thought those were interesting. So, typically the byword is fairness and pertinence, but I think what's pertinent can be debatable. Um, problem solving or kind of a random thing nobody can know the answer to and seeing how you respond under fire might be pertinent, especially for certain jobs. Things that you can't get away with asking is about people's sex life, their political affiliations, their religious faith. Um, I, was once, I was once asked in a job interview, not about my religious faith, but do you think people here will have a problem with your religion? Like someone said, said, do you think someone will have a problem with the fact that you're a Mormon bishop? How do you respond to that? Are you saying I'm not getting this job because I'm, uh, right? Um, but it was probably a legitimate question in a community where people already consider that a form of nepotism, that, that, that Mormons tend to hire Mormons, that type of thing. And that's what they were asking me. They weren't, I don't think they were trying to discriminate against me, except saying, do you foresee if you were to get this job, that it causing any heartburn or heartache in the broader community? Yeah, Tricia. Uh -huh. A political job? That's different, right? Because then it moves back up to pertinence. Same thing with religious things. If I'm a Catholic school and I'm hiring teachers for the students, it's probably reasonable for me to expect them to be Catholic and know that their teaching will be in accordance to the, the principles of our faith. But if I'm hiring a janitor, it may not be as pertinent. Right? They could be of any any faith or whatever. So, again, different groups, sometimes they'll have exceptions to these rules. But honestly, you know, what do you think about gay marriage? That probably has zero to do with almost any job you're hiring somebody for, right? That Their opinion on gay marriage or abortion should probably have zero to do with whether or not you hire them. Now, if you're, if you're looking at a new Supreme Court justice who might make a ruling on the legality of abortion, they're not staying away from that topic at all. In fact, if you've watched any of the confirmation hearings, they've come back to it over and over again. What's his response? I respect the rule of law that has been laid down by previous courts. Isn't that a way to like not give your opinion at all, but to say, the Supreme Court has, has been tasked with this. The Supreme Court has ruled on it, and so I respect that ruling. And as an appellate court judge, you'll see that my rulings went with established law. What that doesn't do, though, is say it doesn't address the fact that if he were a Supreme Court judge, he wouldn't. he's no longer as, as bound to rule on what the Supreme Court said he's now bound to. He can shift or change. So that might matter in that scenario, but not for most jobs. Yeah. So what if, what if like, you know the whole thing that went on with like the the gay couple and the gay thing. Uh huh. What if let's say that one of those guys was trying to get hired there? Mm hmm. Would they be able to refuse it because it was supposed to like get their names to? They'd have a really hard time in court with that, with saying this guy being gay means he can't help us make cakes. It has zero to do with your ability to make a cake or not make a cake. Um. So it would be a, you would probably lose that, that battle in court. It makes it hard Right. Yes. And you have so, and so, you know, if you're going to discriminate, then you've got to, to discriminate on some basis that's fair. Like, can they do the job or can they not do the job? you know, that's not inappropriate. In fact, it's appropriate to say, well, I had another candidate who's already had experience here and this one doesn't. But it is inappropriate to say, and especially in states where sexual orientation is a protected class. Um, in, in the state of Arizona and under federal law right now, it's still not fully recognized that, uh, like race, religion, and other things like that. 
Um, but it's moving that way, and many states have added additional laws to protect sexual orientation as a class. All right, we got to move forward here. Um, so when it comes to wages, um, an issue is wage confidentiality. Do, all, do employees know what the other employee makes? Here at the college, because we're a public institution, it's completely public. You can go right over to the to the library. You can pull the budget preparation book from last year, and you can see exactly how much I make, the college president made, and everybody else made. Okay, it's listed right there for the whole world to see. But that's not that way with a lot of private employers, where you might pay one person 15 bucks an hour, another one 12 bucks an hour. Some people say it's wrong that everybody should know what everybody else makes. Others say that's going to create problems. It's an issue of privacy. So this is an argument in favor of wage confidentiality. These three are arguments opposed to wage confidentiality. Management's more likely to abuse us if we don't know what each other's making. Right? So they'll be using their power to sort of give this their buddy more or whatever. Um, and then the Equal Pay Act of 1963 says that you have to pay people uh, same wage for the same work type of thing. And if nobody knows what anybody makes, how do we know that they're actually complying with that? Okay. And then this issue of wages as incentives. When management makes promises to people, they need to make sure they do so in a clear way. Because when someone says, hey, if we, get this, we close this big sale, everybody's getting a raise, nobody wants to say, like, well, how much of a raise? Or, or, you know, can you spell out the exact terms? At what point will we get a raise and how much will it be? Because that seemed kind of rude and forward. But what happens as a manager if you give them all a one penny raise when you get it? Then, they're, you know, they're not going to work that hard for you in the future. Um, and so, as a, you know, I want you to think from the perspective of a manager, how can I use wages or bonuses as an incentive but not risk alienating or upsetting my people. Some considerations I mentioned in the book for promoting employees include work performance, seniority, and projected work performance. The challenge with all of these is they all have some negatives to them. Work performance sounds like the most obvious and easy one, right? If someone works hard, we promote them. Can you think of any cons to that? Sometimes, yeah, maybe someone who's a really hard worker doesn't mean they're a good manager, right? In fact, that happens a lot. People who are good at a certain job doesn't necessarily mean they can manage others. Seniority, you end up promoting the person who's been there the longest. We know that that's not always good. You find people who, they've so you occupied the seat the longest, but you didn't work that hard. And now you're the boss. Uh, and then projected work performance, and that's a little more subjective when you say, um, I think this person is going to be really great in this role, so we're going to start them at the kind of ground floor, but we're going to promote them faster than other people because we think they're going to be really great as a manager. Um, and, you know, there again, pros and cons to each of them. All right, so the big questions about firing employees is when can they be fired versus when should they be fired? Okay, this is where I talked about at-will employment. Pretty much in the U.S., most states, at-will means you can fire somebody for any reason at any time and don't have to give a reason other than at-will. They were an at-will employee and we no longer need them. Unless they have a contract, that, right, then you have to adhere to the contract. But what mitigates that is fear of lawsuits. We don't just fire people willy-nilly because we're afraid they'll sue us. So we better have a process in place. Um, and then sometimes state legislation. Some states have made it harder to fire people. You have to give cause or you have to uh, go through some process that the state says. Usually what the state legislation will say is if you follow this process in firing people, you'll be protected. If you don't follow it, you won't be protected. Um, but the more ethical and moral issue, this is a legal issue, the more ethical and moral issue is when should an employee be fired? And it's especially hard when it's due to economic slowdowns. So if we're, we just don't have the money to pay all our employees anymore, we need to get rid of some of them, how do we decide who goes? Some people use an inverted seniority scale. The last person hired is the first one to go. Downside? 
they might be a really great employee and you might have some people that have been here a while that aren't that great right based on workload like this division is getting shut down so everybody that works in this division is not going to be here anymore but these guys over here again the downside is you may have some really great employees in this division may it be better to retrain them over to the other division and get rid of some of the dead wood there um, uh, and then recovery preparation would be like uh, we're going to lay off certain people but keep other people based on those groups we think will best help us as we come out of this as we recover from this economic downturn and then due to performance they talked about rank and yank which was GE's policy where they that what what they would do is they would ask each supervisor in sections to rank their people from their best people to their worst people and then they would take their lowest 10 percent and just get rid of them and hire new people in and see if they would do better than that lowest 10 percent and then a year or two later rank them all again so I think the the pro to that is it's like a constant improvement cycle but the con is that everybody is freaking running scared all the time right and some people would say that's great run scared and work hard but I think people on the you know that's pretty scary to think that your supervisors like you know you'd be like where am I at right now like am I at like which percentile am I in, right? And then misconduct, you know, that's that's easier. When somebody is stealing from the company or when somebody's lying or cheating or whatever, that makes it less hard. So we're just about out of time. Um, one more thing, so here, how do you fire people? And what you wanna do is you wanna have them leave okay with it. You know, they're not gonna leave happy. So the way you do that is you address them honestly. You don't do this bull crap of putting a, a note on their door, right? You sit down and you talk to them. You speak firmly. You don't waver. You don't offer false hope. And it really shouldn't be a complete surprise. If someone's getting fired, probably they should have been sanctioned multiple times before. You'd have gone through a process, right? And they know, that, hey, if this happens again, we're going to have to let you go. Um, because if you do that and they're still mad, you you did everything you could. You know, let's, let's say someone's habitually late or something, and you say, look, or somebody steals from the company, and they know there's a policy that says if you steal from the company, that's a one-time thing, and you're fired. It shouldn't be a surprise. You stole, you were caught, you're fired, right? It's when someone thinks things are going along great, and then they come in one day and they're fired that things go really south. Don't allow them to disrupt other employees. Minimize the financial costs. Usually you do that by having a, a system so that they can't really sue you because you followed your procedures and your policies closely. Minimize humiliation, which kind of goes with the positive feeling, right? Do it in a private setting. Don't tell them they're fired in front of everybody else. Uh, hold the severance meeting at the end of the day and at the end of the week so that it's not like you're firing them at 8 in the morning and then they have to, like, sit there in their, uh, their cubicle for the rest of the day and then go home. But call them in at the end of the day. Um, give them the opportunity to choose if they want to just kind of quietly leave or if they'd like to go say goodbye to everybody. But that gets hard with the don't let them disrupt, right? Because they could go in and be like, guess what? You know. And make sure they get paid the money that's coming to them quickly and without any red tape. Those things really help with the process. Um, and then the things you can do to minimize the need for firing people. Mostly it's like retrain your people, let them work in cross-functional jobs, offer them development activities so that if one division has to close down, you may be able to take some of them and use them in another division, and, uh, you know, especially the ones you know are strong. So those are just sort of, you know, if, if, if you're proactive, a lot of times you can minimize, minimize the amount of firing that has to happen, especially from an economic downturn. All right. That was a lot of stuff, and I tried to rush through it there at the end. Um, 